Hi, I'm Ranger Lauren of Boston National Historical Park. Today we'll revisit one of Boston's most prominent doctors and political leaders. Here are five more things you should know about Dr. Joseph Warren. Complying with the Intolerable Acts, which punished Boston for the destruction of the tea, General Thomas Gage refused to allow the Massachusetts General Court to convene in 1774. In response, Joseph Warren and others formed an extra-legal shadow government, known as the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, which met right here at the Wright Tavern in Concord. Joseph Warren was elected to represent Boston, marking the first time he had ever held a political office. Warren instantly became a kinetic figure and an omnipresent force at the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. He was chosen to be a member of the Committee of Safety, which oversaw the colony's military matters. He began overseeing the stockpiling of military supplies and the training of the militia. He also orchestrated a spy ring, which directly brought him the intelligence leading to the first shots of the American Revolution. We remember Paul Revere famously riding his horse through the Massachusetts countryside, alerting the local towns of the approaching British troops. But without Dr. Joseph Warren, there would not have been a midnight ride. Joseph Warren received intelligence that General Thomas Gage was planning to send British troops to search for stockpiled weapons and gunpowder in Concord. It was also rumored that he planned to arrest Sons of Liberty leaders Samuel Adams and John Hancock who were nearby Lexington. Joseph Warren dispatched one rider, William Dawes, and then he called upon a second, Paul Revere. Revere and Dawes set out with Warren's instructions to alert the town militias of the advancing British soldiers. They met up with a third rider, Samuel Prescott, who joined them in their mission. Paul Revere was captured here at gunpoint by British troops along present-day Battle Road of Minuteman National Historical Park but Samuel Prescott completed the mission, making it all the way to Concord. We refer to the events of April 19, 1775, as the Battles of Lexington and Concord. Yet the fiercest fighting of that day took place in Monotomy, present-day Arlington, Massachusetts, on the British retreat back to Boston. As word spread that British soldiers opened fire leaving militiamen dead in Lexington. And then here at the North Bridge in Concord, men from nearby towns grabbed their muskets and hid along the road back to Boston, firing upon the King's troops. Joseph Warren had ridden out to Monotomy, and as the British soldiers approached, he joined in the heated fighting. General William Heath recalled, quote, a musket ball came so near to the head of Dr. Warren as to strike the pin out of the hair of his earlock. Joseph Warren had come within an inch of losing his life on day one of the American Revolution. You'd think that after such a close encounter with death, anyone would be weary of stepping foot on another battlefield, but not Dr. Joseph Warren. On June 17, 1775, he arrived at the colonial fortifications here on Breed's Hill, welcomed with shouts and cheers. His presence lifted the spirit and morale of the exhausted militiamen, most of whom had been working to fortify Breed's Hill since the previous evening. British Lieutenant John Clark described Joseph Warren's attire the day of the Battle of Bunker Hill as being his Sunday best. He wore, quote, a light colored coat with satin waistcoat laced with silver and white breeches with silver loops. Certainly, Joseph Warren's attire must have made him a target on this battlefield, standing next to his fellow soldiers, most of whom were wearing homespun clothing, now stained with sweat, dust, and dirt. Despite the contrast, Joseph Warren fought alongside and died with these men as their equal. Warren fell at the Battle of Bunker Hill during the colonial retreat, when a musket ball struck right below his left eye. How should we remember Joseph Warren's service to and sacrifice for his country? When Joseph Warren fell here at the Battle of Bunker Hill, he became the first great martyr of the American Revolution. Half a century before construction of the Bunker Hill Monument began, there was talks of dedicating a monument in Warren's memory. 
1777, Samuel Adams wrote a letter to Warren's fiance, stating that he had made a motion in the Continental Congress that a monument should be dedicated to Dr. Warren. But it wasn't until 1794 that Massachusetts Freemasons came together and dedicated an 18-foot-tall wooden pillar here on Breeds Hill for Dr. Warren. By the 1820s, just in time for the 50th anniversary of the battle, many began calling for a larger and statelier Bunker Hill Monument that would honor not just Joseph Warren, but all the brave men that fell there in the cause of human liberty. Today, you can find a replica of the original 1794 monument to Joseph Warren at the base of the Bunker Hill Monument. I have just heard that our dear friend Dr. Warren is no more, but fell gloriously fighting for his country. Abigail Adams lamented in a letter to her husband John one day after the Battle of Bunker Hill. Had he survived, we can only guess what the ambitious Joseph Warren would have gone on to achieve for the new nation as a military and political leader. Loyalist Peter Oliver noted after the war, had Warren lived, George Washington would have been in obscurity. Today, we continue to honor Joseph Warren's service and sacrifice for the cause he so strongly believed in. Thank you for joining me today for five more things you should know about Dr. Joseph Warren.